hurried up to the mine entrance, looking over my shoulder for Charles as I went. I knew he wouldn't believe me if I told him what I'd seen in the mine. I hardly believed it myself. But I knew what I had to do, even if that meant locking the gold seam up in there forever. The mine was on my farm anyway. The land had been in my family for over 50 years, ever since my grandfather came over on a steamship in 1860 and used his life savings to purchase the lot for his family. It had served us well, and that was even before I discovered gold in the cave up on the low hill that backed one of our fields. Since I knew next to nothing about mining, I sought the advice of a friend who had done well for himself selling mining tools, mostly to coal miners. But he was the only one I trusted who knew anything about mining. He agreed to a 60-40 split, and we got to work. That was two years ago now, and we pulled enough gold out of the mine to make us and our families both comfortable. But Charles was confident there was much more to be had. But he hadn't seen what I'd seen. He hadn't witnessed what I had in that dark mine. No, it was over. There was no choice but for me to shut the mine for good before that thing got out. I looked over my shoulder one last time as I reached the level ground outside the mine entrance. Charles was usually here by now, but I didn't see him coming up the road to the house or from the house to the hill. That was good. If he wasn't here, he wouldn't try to stop me. I set the box of dynamite down next to the mine entrance and flipped its lid open. Then I got the tin of fuse caps out of my pocket and opened it. I went about putting the fuse caps into the sticks of dynamite to get them ready, all the while glancing up at the dark mine entrance. I could hear the thing in there, scratching and screeching and grunting. Given the prey I'd seen it capture earlier, I was hopeful it wasn't hungry. When I had the dynamite ready, I lit a kerosene lantern and stepped cautiously into the mine with as many sticks of dynamite as I could carry. The sounds I'd been hearing outside were amplified by the cave walls, making me twitch with revulsion. They were not the sounds of any of God's animals. The grunts were wet and always followed by a screeching sound. And the scratching, I knew, was the sound of the thing feeding by pulling ever more of its prey into its strange mouth. My reason for haste was driven by a fear of what would become of the creature when it regained its strength. It was clear to me that I had awoken the beast from a long hibernation when I busted through its stone enclosure this morning. How long had it been entombed there? I had no way of knowing. But I knew it had been hungry. The only reason I was alive now was because God had seen fit to have one of the curious goats we kept on the farm nearby when the creature chased me out of the cave. Had the goat not been an easier meal, I had no doubt that I would be the one clutched in the creature's sharp and numerous claws. I placed the explosive sticks in various clefts, keenly aware of my proximity to the beast. The ones with longer fuses, I placed deeper in the mine to give me time to light the others and get clear. Then I headed back out to fetch the remaining dynamite so I could place them and light them in sequence. But as I came to the mouth of the mine, I saw Charles looking down in consternation at the dynamite I'd left. What in God's name are you doing, Henry? He asked when he saw me. We must close the mine, I said. There's a demon in there, Charles. And I already know what you will say, but you must believe me. If you've ever been my very good friend and partner, you will believe my words as though they were spoken by God himself. Charles looked at me like I was a dim-witted mule for a long moment before shaking his head. He will do no such thing. If there's something in there, it's a bear or perhaps a mountain lion. Your imagination does you no service. As always, Charles was carrying his rifle over one shoulder. He moved forward and snatched the lantern out of my hand. No, Charles, I said, gripping his arm. He struck me in the chest with the butt of his rifle, sending me stumbling and rolling partway down the hill. Looking down at me with regret in his eyes, he shook his head. I'll handle this, he said, moving quickly into the mine. I got up and ran the 20 feet up the hill into the darkness of the mine. Before I made it six feet in, a rifle shot echoed off the walls, followed quickly by another. I thought I heard something else under that second shot, perhaps a cry of pain. As I moved around the bend in the mine to where I'd broken through to the creature's lair, I saw Charles running toward me, his eyes brimming with fear. Run! He screamed, just as a shape reared up behind him. Four paws like giant and black raccoon heads shot out and grabbed him around the torso, ripping him backward and causing him to drop both lantern and rifle. The lantern broke, the kerosene spilling out and spreading the flame with it. In that expanding half-light, I watched as Charles's head was pulled into the strange sideways mouth. 
blood spewed forth as the savage teeth clamped onto his neck. The flame touched one of the sticks of dynamite I planted low down, igniting the fuse. Fumbling the matches out of my pocket, I moved back through the mine, lighting the other sticks I planted while I counted down in my mind. I got most of them lit before the countdown reached three, and I threw the match down as I sprinted for the exit. Just as I reached the mouth of the mine, the first stick exploded, followed quickly by the others. The concussive force of the explosions sent me tumbling down the hill. Flying stones and boulders pelted the ground around me as I fell. I rolled to a stop at the bottom of the hill. A moment later, a boulder the size of my head came to a stop not a foot away. It was bright yellow in color, and at a glance, I could tell that it was probably 80% gold. The shotgun blast rang out when I was still in the outskirts of town, but I didn't have to see the violence to know what happened. The silence made things plain enough. The silence of shocked and scared people just trying to survive. I didn't have to see the scene to know who'd done the shooting. Walter Jessup, who worked directly for the coal mine owner, had made clear that he'd shoot anyone handing out literature promoting unionization. At the time, I thought he was bluffing. I should have known better. I raced into the small Appalachian town to find Clarence Williams dead in the middle of the muddy thoroughfare, the wind stirring the painstakingly printed flyers still gripped in one hand. My fellow coal miners stood around in shock, staring at Jessup who stood nearby with a shotgun propped on his shoulder, a smirk under his pointy mustache. As I looked at him, the bastard winked at me. Now, I'd seen enough death in the mines to not be surprised by the sight of a man with a hole in his chest, but it didn't make the hurt any easier to handle. Clarence was only 19, and he had a wife and a baby daughter who were now on their own, all because he wanted to join the United Mine Workers of America to get fair wages. He was a good man, a hard worker, a good father. I resisted the urge to speak my mind to Jessup right then and there. This had gone on long enough. I thought we could do things the right way, the American way, the way everyone said was possible. But now I saw that it wasn't possible. The coal company owned the town, and even though the sheriff's office was nearby, there was no sign of any law enforcement officer, none at all, because the company owned them too. I knew Jessup wouldn't be arrested for the cold-blooded murder, not in this town. So I gathered some men, and we took Clarence's body over to the undertaker. Then I discussed things with Earl and Lewis, and was not surprised to find that my coworkers were willing to give my way a try. After all, they'd both seen the same things I'd seen in the black mines. They'd experienced things that couldn't be explained away. Some people called them Tommyknockers but the things that lived in the mines in this part of West Virginia didn't look like little men. And leaving little bits of saffron cake would only fulfill their hunger for so long. We just called them the dark ones. As Earl, Lewis, and I talked, we all agreed on one thing. We'd have to bring our little friends something considerable in order to get them to do what we wanted. Luckily, we knew just the person to bring them. He worked directly for the mine owner, Mr. Davenport, and he just killed one of our friends. So we got to work. It was after 10 o'clock that night when I marched up to Davenport's house and looked through a window to find the man himself sitting with a glass of liquor next to a fire in a plush sitting room. I went to the front door and used the shotgun I procured to blast the lockout. I kicked the door in and stepped into the wide entryway of the man's massive two-story house. Dressed in bedclothes, Davenport came rushing out of the sitting room, screaming, he had a Colt revolver in one hand, and when he saw me standing there, alone in the doorway with the shotgun propped on my shoulder, he stopped and leveled the revolver at my face. There's only one of you, he said, fighting a smile. He must be crazy. A moment later, two men with rifles came running from what must have been the servants' quarters. I recognized them both. They were Jessup's men. Now there were three guns pointing at me. Do you insist on fighting our efforts to unionize, Mr. Davenport? I asked. The man with the coiffed hair who'd never had a speck of coal dust on him looked in disbelief at the other two men. They all smiled. Where's Jessup? Davenport asked the men. I think we should let him do the honors. Before either men could answer, I tossed the shotgun down onto the floor. Look familiar? I asked. Davenport looked at the weapon, realization coming into his face. What have you done with him? If you laid a finger on him, you'll hang. You'll... The word stuck in the man's throat 
as he looked past me at the still open double doors. The other two men suddenly became pale as they, too, peered at the darkness outside. What the hell are those? Davenport asked. When I gave no answer, he screamed. What are they? As I heard the soft scratches of their footfalls behind me, the two men with rifles broke and ran. Get back here, you cowards! Davenport yelled, but then he broke and ran, scrambling toward the stairwell behind him. A sea of little coal black bodies, some of them walking on all fours, others on their hind legs, rushed around me. Most of them went after Davenport, but others raced toward the servants' quarters. Their solid white eyes were wide open under pointed ears. Their mouths were open and drooling in anticipation. Needle-sharp teeth gleamed. They were far too quick for Davenport, and they caught him before he made it halfway up the stairs. The man's screams of pain were quickly muffled as the dark ones enveloped him. Earl and Lewis stepped up beside me, and we watched. From the servants' quarters, we heard similar screams. When the screams had stopped and the creatures had dispersed back to the mine, we went home to our families. A week later, we joined the United Mine Workers of America Union. I'd only been working at the mine for a week when it happened. To this day, I can't explain it. Not in any way that makes logical sense. But I'd grown up in a mining family. My father and grandfather and great-grandfather had all worked in the mines. And although coal mining was slowly dying because of all the concerns about global warming, I didn't think twice about getting into the career. So when I graduated high school in 2022, I got a job in the mine. For your first 45 days in the mine, you're not allowed to operate any machinery. There's a lot of heavy equipment used in modern mining, and it can be very dangerous in the wrong hands. So for the first 45 days, you have to wear a special sticker on your hard hat that says you can't operate machinery. In fact, for the first year, you have to wear a specially colored hard hat to differentiate you from those who've been working underground for a year or more. So I donned my bright orange hard hat with the sticker on it and boarded the man trip, essentially a very long, low, and roofless transport vehicle. You see, there's not enough room to even stand up in the mine I worked at so you do all your work on your knees or crouched down. This means that all the equipment must be low enough to fit inside the mine. Our heads passed inches below the gouged ceiling as we drove over a mile into the mine. As we went, I peered up at the roof bolts, thinking about the possibility of a roof fall. Although the system of using roof bolts to prevent roof falls from happening has decreased the likelihood of getting crushed by falling rocks, it still happens sometimes. In fact, not two weeks before I started, a man had been killed in a cave-in. It was all part of the job. Coal mining is dangerous work, even today. But this knowledge didn't keep me from the job. The driver of the man trip stopped and let me off at the conveyor belt. My job for the first few hours of the shift was to clean out coal that had fallen off the conveyor belt so it wouldn't build up too high and damage the equipment. I grabbed a short shovel and got to work moving on my knees as I scraped up coal from the ground and dumped it onto the conveyor belt. The constantly running belt would take it all the way outside, where the coal would be processed and prepared for loading onto train cars. I'd been working for about an hour, and the shuttle car had come and gone several times, dumping new coal onto the belt with every load. It was after the shuttle car pulled away that I sensed someone coming up behind me. I turned to see a man I didn't recognize hustling up to me, just then, I heard a knocking sound from above where I was working. Move! The man shouted, coming up to grab my arm. I dropped the shovel and scrambled out of the way just as a huge piece of stone fell from the ceiling, crashing into the conveyor belt and the narrow aisle next to it where I'd just been standing. But the roof fall wasn't done. The man pulled me along, and we ran, crouched over as entire sections of the roof fell down. Just as we were getting to a cut where we could turn right, a boulder the size of a car fell down right in front of me and crushed the man. He was there one second and gone the next, like he was no more than an ant under someone's boot. I banged into the boulder and then fell to my knees as the sound of violently shifting rock enveloped me. I covered my head with my arms as a few small stones pelted me. One larger rock smashed into my leg, causing me to cry out in pain. But then the ceiling stopped falling and I found myself in a little space about three feet wide and four feet deep. 
There were huge boulders on three sides and a pile of smaller ones on the fourth. And although my leg hurt where the bowling ball sized rock hit it, I didn't think it was broken. I was able to see a small portion of the man who saved my life. His leg stuck out from under the edge of the boulder that had killed him. I sat there a long time, staring at that foot, wondering if I would suffocate or starve. I had no idea how bad the damage was. Several hours later, I was rescued when a team dug me out. But as the guys were helping me out to get me back to the surface, I stopped them. Wait, I said, there's a man back there. He died saving my life. We can't leave his body down here. The two rescue workers looked at each other and then at me. Everyone else is accounted for, he said. You're the only one missing. That can't be possible. He was crushed. You can see his leg. Go look, you'll see it. One guy climbed back over the rocks and looked in the little alcove where I'd been. When he came back, he shook his head. I don't see any leg, kid. Let's get you out of here. I pulled away and said, I'll show you. But when I got back to the alcove, I couldn't find the leg either. I looked around for several minutes before the men finally pulled me out and got me to the surface. It was only later, when I described my savior's appearance to my coworkers, that I realized what had really happened. That sounds exactly like Randy West, one of my coworkers said, looking suddenly sick. But that's not possible. He died in a roof fall two weeks before you came to work here. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy these stories, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and check out some more of my episodes here.